Tim Lucas, thank you for joining me. We're here to talk about the upcoming Blue, uh, Blu-ray release of Kino Lorber's uh, Alphaville, or their release of, Alpha, of Alphaville, excuse me. Um, I would like to uh, back up, though, a bit and like to hear uh, from you about your contributions to the video review, the home video review, uh, back in the day. Um, which home video review do you mean? Uh, back in the 80s, I read that you were the first person to start really reviewing home videos back in... Like, oh, um, back in the, in the 80s, uh, say 1985, uh, I was a, a reviewer for a magazine out of Chicago called Video Times. Um, and after a while, uh, Video Times morphed into another thing called uh, Video Movies. Uh, but in, in that magazine, I, I think it was in their Halloween issue of 1985, October of 85, uh, we introduced a, a column called Video Watchdog. And uh, that came about because I was assigned to do a review of a new home video release of Hercules starring Steve Reeves. And just shortly before I received that, that cassette uh i happened to see the film on television and so when i was watching the cassette i realized that it had a completely different set of opening credits and even the dubbing of the uh, performances was different so uh fortunately i had recorded the off the air version and uh so i I did a sort of quick comparison not not as in-depth as as they later became um but i uh pointed out to my editor there at the at the magazine, Matthew White, that uh, I really didn't believe that home video reviews should just be movie reviews, which is basically what they were at that time. I said uh, the reviewers need to be more conscious of the versions that they can see otherwise or even theatrically and what comes out in the home video version because there's a lot of changes being made. Um, especially with widescreen films, they would crop off basically half the image. It might be the center of the image or the frame. The square frame might be floating from one edge of the frame in widescreen to the other in those days in in a process that was called pan and scan. Um, So my editor said, oh, kind of like a video watchdog. And I said, the video watchdog. (laughs) And... uh, so that went into into action uh, with that October issue, and and it stayed with them until uh, just before the magazine expired a couple of years later. And after that, I took the uh, video watchdog theme and adapted it to another couple of magazines, including one that was uh, shot just as an experiment on videotape. It was a video magazine on videotape that was produced by Michael Nesmith. Uh, of the monkeys uh he had a company called pacific arts video that was very much on the cutting edge of what was happening in home video and and that was his experiment but it didn't really survive its first issue um and then there was uh i i adapted it because because a lot of the problems that were happening with home video were happening to horror movies um i did a specific horror slash fantasy version of Video Watchdog uh, that appeared in Gore Zone magazine, uh, which was a spinoff from Fangoria. Um, And then after about a year of that, I found that I was in possession of so much information uh, that there was more than I could actually put into the Gore Zone column. And so we decided, my wife and I, Donna, uh, to spin it off into a magazine of our own which we published out of our house for the next 27 years. <laughs> uh, v- Video Watchdog as a magazine, uh, full color magazine by the end, uh, remained in business for 27 years. So that brings us up to date with, with that. Yeah, that's a pretty thorough history. So please tell me why you think the French New Wave remains um, important and why people will still discuss it. Uh, The French New Wave uh, is just fresh. It remains fresh. It remains um, somehow uh, irreverent yet worthy of reverence. Um, 
it's uh, it's not. I, I would say that it, it doesn't set out to be romantic uh, in in the broadest sense, but it is an extremely romantic form of of filmmaking. There's a great essence of of love and passion at the core of it, uh, even when its outward pretensions are to be something more serious or something more political. Um, and uh, you can you can find an awful lot of what became great talent over over the next 10, 20 years in its youngest uh, form. So it's prone to experimentation. It's prone to playfulness. And uh, it's also the first self-aware form of, of cinema. It makes a lot of references to pre-existing cinema, uh, Hollywood cinema in particular, like uh, Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless opening up with a dedication to monogram pictures. I mean, there are a lot of people who who love Breathless who have no idea what monogram pictures means, <laughs> even if they've seen it endless times on The Late Late Show. Um, but uh, But that kind of of uh, fealty to classic cinema runs through uh, the new wave. And I, I think that's a, a great part of it. it's important too. It's the first really self-conscious form of cinema. Did you enjoy Godard's latest effort, the image book? You know, I haven't seen it yet. Um, I, I don't keep up with, with Godard as, as closely as I should. I'm, I'm a bit behind on that. I have to be in a special mood. <laughs> It's it's very Godard. That's all I'll say. Uh, yeah. uh, how did Alphaville affect you the the first time you saw it? Um, the first time I saw it, oddly enough, was on television uh, here in Cincinnati, where I live and work. Uh, in in uh, 1969, 1970, we had a new television station that came on the air uh, called WXIX Television. It was Channel 19. And they were the first independent station in our area. And on Sunday nights, they introduced a block of, of films uh, to our block of airtime that they gave the uh, very tantalizing title for adults only. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there was always a, a hint that if you tuned in, you might see something you would never see on another channel. Um, and back in those days, there were only three or four channels. Um, but, but thanks to that uh, block of programming, I was able to see for the first time movies by Ingmar Bergman and Godard and uh, also films like Peter Brook's Lord of the Flies, uh, Tony Richardson's A Taste of Honey, um, the, the Sidney Lumet's The Pawnbroker, films like that. Um, and, uh, and they would be completely uncut. Uh, and, but, but the strange thing is, is that in the case of the Bergman films and in case of Alphaville, uh, they were also dubbed into English. And it's not easy to find these films dubbed into English now because dubbing has become a sort of uh, negative. It has a negative image now. But in, in, in that period, in the 60s and in the 70s, when it was the only way you could see uh, foreign films for the most part, uh, conveniently on, on television, uh, dubbing became a very interesting connection because often, often, uh, I, I would, for example, I would recognize voices from one film to another. And, and I, so I started thinking, oh, it's, it's my old friends from, from that Sons of Hercules movie. Yeah. <laughs> They're slumming here on this, uh, Ingmar Bergman film, uh, even though it was vice versa. But, uh, so, so that was a very interesting time, and and when I saw Alphaville, um, I I just really loved its atmosphere. I I was only about twelve or thirteen years old at the time. I really didn't have the background in film or the vocabulary then to uh, express everything I saw. But it it was exciting the the uh, the confluence of the, uh, the the music by Paul Misraki, which is so charged with danger. Um, even though in the course of the movie, you seldom see anything more dangerous than Eddie Constantine walking down a hotel corridor, mm -hmm. but the music is there. Um, and, uh, I, I just, I just found it very interesting. It was, it was absolutely unlike any science fiction film I'd seen before. 
And uh, I was always drawn to, to European film above all because it had this sort of alien, disembodied look and sound to it because of the dubbing. How do you go about to contextualize Godardo in a commentary track? Uh, well, my own approach to commentaries differs from film to film, actually. I mean, uh, it's my preferred approach to go through a film and respond to it scene by scene and then use those scenes as cues to go into background material that I may have. Um, actually, with, with the Alpha Veal commentary that I did for Kino Lorber, I didn't contextualize Godard so much as I contextualize Eddie Constantine, who I think is much more in need of contextualizing uh, for American viewers at this point. I, I believe that thanks to the Criterion Collection and uh, other art house companies like that, that, that Godard has uh, an audience. Uh, he, people understand him, uh, you know, even if they know just a little bit about him, they know that his early films were more approachable, that he became politicized in the late 70s. And and then became more abstract as time went on um, and, and personal. So, um, but what people don't know when they approach Alphaville for the most part is that it was a film based on a character that Eddie Constantine had been playing in, in French film since 1953. Lemmy Caution, who was based on a, a character invented by a British writer named Peter Cheney. Uh, and Lemmy Caution was the hero of something like, you know, 15 or 20 books. Um, and uh, you, you can find them in, in used stores. They're, they're very peculiar books. They're, they're sort of difficult for me to read, for example, um, because they're an English writer trying to write an American hard-boiled sort of Mickey Spillane book. And he's just a bit too polite to do that. And so, and so it doesn't quite ring true. The books don't quite ring true as hard-boiled detective fiction. And, uh, but when they went to, uh, when, when they were filmed, Eddie Constantine uh, did the first one called Poison Ivy, Le Môme de Verdegris, uh, in 1953, and the bad guy in that film was an actor named Howard Vernon. And Vernon uh, actually plays uh, Lemmy Caution's adversary, uh, whose, whose name is uh, Professor uh, Von Braun. Uh, and then his real name is given as uh, Leonard Nosferatu. <laughs> um, <laughs> But but the, the two these two actors who first opposed one another in nineteen in nineteen fifty three are brought back together in in Alphaville. So there's a very strong consciousness there of of all the films that he made as that character over that period. But it's a very atypical Lemmy Caution adventure. The movie is subtitled A Strange Adventure of Lemmy Caution. And it really is because it doesn't have the tongue in cheek humor that that his Let Me Caution pictures from, from the earlier part of his career had. Those, those films, and Le Monde de Verdegris in particular, have, uh, I mean, they, they're, it's like seeing the first James Bond film. Um, there's a lot about that film that influenced, I believe, directly what the, uh, the James Bond film series became, you know, with gadgets and uh, uh, two-fisted uh, whiskey-slugging, life-loving uh secret agent who's not too secret about his <laughs> his qualifications um but a sort of also a, a sort of ugly american character abroad at the same time may you elaborate on the uh, production design of alphaville uh the funny thing about the production design of alphaville is that there wasn't any basically oh. uh they uh they shot on actual locations entirely there was there was one location that was a hotel there was another hotel location um and there was uh a, a, a television center a radio and television center where they shot a lot of the 
uh, scenes that you see that take place in sound booths with dangling uh, microphones. And uh, it looked on the outside. It was it was a new building, brand new building, and it looked from the outside sort of like a credit or computer card uh, standing up against the night sky. So what happened was is that Godard decided to make a science fiction film, but it's only a conceptual science fiction film. It's not got any special effects whatsoever. Uh, the only special effect is a couple of times when the uh, the positive screen image goes negative mm-hmm. and it's really just for an unsettling effect to to demonstrate that something is going wrong with whatever is in control of this image process um sorry no no problem uh but but that's the point i mean it was all shot very direct and it was left to the viewer to decide how much of their own imagination they were going to bring to the process. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of science fiction writers hold this film very highly. And in fact, J.G. Ballard, who wrote uh, Crash and High Rise and, uh, and uh, uh, Empire of the Sun, can, considered it to be the greatest science fiction film of all time. Wow. Yeah. That's that's a great segue. Have there been any tributes to Alphaville since it's uh, in in other art forms or in films since its release? Well, I, I know that there is a band by the name of Alphaville, um, and uh, in, in terms of other tributes, I know that that uh, Eddie Constantine went on to make other uh, films as Lemmy Caution. And in fact, just around the end of the 20th century, Godard brought him back and made a a movie with him again in the Lemmy Caution role. It was called uh, Germany. Uh, I believe it was. We'll, we'll look it up. We'll, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. something like Germany, Germany year. Not Germany 90, year zero. Nine zero. Oh, that's amazing. Something like that. Um, and in that, it was basically a rumination on the, uh, the collapse of the, uh, Iron Curtain and what, what the opening, uh, between Eastern and Western Europe was going to mean, uh, to the, to the men who lost their lives as spies and secret agents maintaining that cold war, uh, while the wall was still in effect. And so let me caution basically stands uh, in scenery, and you get voiceovers, uh, which are basically Godard uh, ruminating on, you know, why why did this character have to, you know, waste his life <laughs> <laughs> if this is where we ended up? I mean, what did it, what did it all mean? So it's a very fascinating response, and it's I I, I wish that uh, more people had access to it because it's it's one of Godard's most fascinating later films. Do you enjoy or even understand Godard's writing on film? Um, actually, I've, I've not. I, I, I have. I have a book called uh, Godard on Godard, and yes, I, I do appreciate that. I mean, I've, I've not read a lot of uh, of his other work. I've read a couple of books on him that were helpful to me, um, but uh, but not his own essays specifically. Yeah, I find his essays and his interviews a little rambly and incoherent, while interesting, just kind of lucid and kind of stream of consciousness. That's just me personally. Uh, but Godard made, uh, as, you, as you and I both know, he made many excellent projects in the 1960s, but then there's kind of that decline. Uh, why do you believe that specifically happened? Oh, I, I think it's because he uh, ha- had other points of interest. I mean, you, you can see, e- even in, in Alphaville, you can see that there's an interest there that's that's moving away from popular drama. Uh, and he wants to get some other message in there. He wants to lure people in with one thing, but he wants to give them something else, something more personal. You can even see this in Contempt, you know, which... Which I think is probably his his greatest picture by by uh, common consensus. Um, they uh, th- that film opens with uh, Br- Brigitte Bardot and Michelle Piccoli in in bed, uh, and it was only shot because 
Godard's producer wanted a nude scene for Bardot in the picture. So she's lying there, stomach down, you know, with her bare bottom during this sort of abstract conversation. And and Godard begins to overlay uh, color filters over the scene and, and just makes it very choppy and uh, abstract and artistic. Um so in a way, he was he was playing with what the public demanded. And as time went on, I think he just became very concerned with uh, the state of the world and uh, wanted his films to reflect that because he felt that uh, cinema as an entertainment might be too frivolous. It might not be sufficient to its potential. And, uh, you know, th- there's still a lot in, in his films uh the later films that uh, that I find very compelling, especially in his 80s work, um, like First Name Carmen and Detective. That was a very rich period, I think. Um, so I don't know what else I could say to uh, to answer your question. Fair enough. Uh, and, and in so many ways, it becomes subjective. What's good, what's bad. Uh, yeah. But Tim Lucas, thank you so much for telling me about yourself, your career, and Alphaville. Are there any other things that you've worked on uh, recently that, you, that, that you're able or would like to share? Sure. Um, I've actually just finished my 98th audio commentary. I'm honing wow. in on 100. Uh, 98 was, uh, actually Alphaville was 97, 98 was last year at Marion Bat. Oh my God. Uh, the Elan René film scripted by Elan Robrier, who's one of my favorite novelists. And so I actually did commentaries for five of his films for a box set that came out in the UK. Um, and that's, that's like just a highlight of my career and any opportunity that I get to write, write about his work or to speak about his work is a great honor and pleasure for me. Um, and I'm about to start work on Alfred Hitchcock's blackmail, his first sound feature and also his last silent feature. It was shot in two versions. Very nice. So um, that's what's on the, uh, agenda right now. Well, that's great. I just finished reading Hitchcock and Truffaut. Great read. And uh, I want you're a humble man. I want I want to let our audience know that Quentin Tarantino says that you wrote the best book on cinema, your book on Mario Bava. So that must be a nice uh, quote to have on the resume. Yes, yes, I'm very very happy with that. And you know, the book is one of those things. It took me like over 30 years to research and to write, and uh, I, I just felt very humbled by the experience. Uh, it's. I'm proud of it. It's still available as a uh, a digital book through oh. uh, through videowatchdog.com. Well, um, I, I know I'm going to get it. It's easier to read in bed too because that book is 12 pounds and it's oh. in its actual form <laughs> and it's out of print. <laughs> All right, well thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you.